and welcome to RCA Radio, a podcast covering the latest news and challenges in regulatory compliance and quality assurance that are facing the pharmaceutical, medical device, and biologics industries. I'm your host, Erica Porcelli. In this episode, we're discussing the burgeoning cannabis industry and the regulatory framework governing cannabis currently and anticipated regulatory developments at the federal and state levels, as well as the FDA's likely path on oversight of this market. Today, I'm joined by Neil Pankow. Neil is RCA's Executive Vice President of Pharmaceuticals and has been closely monitoring developments as this new market emerges. Neil, welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm excited to, to get started <clears throat> on my first podcast ever. <laughs> well, I know we've been talking a lot about cannabis. And I think one of the things that would be really helpful for our listeners is if you could provide us a bit of background on cannabis, marijuana, CBD, you know, all of the other things that come along with it and how the landscape has evolved over the last three to five years. Sure. Uh, and, and this may be real basic for some people, for somebody like me who, who you know, is, was not familiar with the product. Um, uh, it was, it, it's, it's, it's all academic and learning for me. So I think first we should discuss the terminology. So we know what we're talking about because a lot of these terms seem to be used interchangeably and they really shouldn't be. So again, it might be basic for some, but for others this might help clarify um, the topics we're discussing here today. So for those who are unfamiliar with the terminology and what the difference is, cannabis is a family of plants and they include both hemp and marijuana, a couple other terms that I think folks are familiar with. For our purposes, from a regulatory standpoint, hemp is defined as cannabis with a THC content less than 0.3%. So we'll get to the THC in a moment. Marijuana, on the other hand, is cannabis with a THC content greater than 0.3%. And cannabis, it produces a variety of compounds. And the two most, I think, famous or or well-known out there are CBD, cannabidiol, cannabidiol, that folks are seem to be seen everywhere, and THC, which is, and I'm probably mispronounced this, but delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol, and the THC is the one with the psychoactive properties. That's the high that people get. That's the recreational marijuana smokers uh, that have been there for for years. So what has started the buzz, no pun intended, <clears throat> although I think it's been building for some time. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, but the triggering event really comes from the Agriculture Improvement Act of 2018, or the Farm Bill, as, ev- as everybody knows it as. The 2018 Farm Bill makes hemp production and distribution legal under federal law, and it establishes a regulatory framework for oversight at the federal, state, and tribal levels. So how do you define hemp? Well, back to the definitions I provided. The key is the amount of THC in the plant. The Farm Bill makes production and distribution of hemp legal as long as the plant contains no more than a 0.3% concentration of THC. So anything above that 0.3% means that it remains as a Schedule I controlled substance. So that's really the cutoff. So hemp is not controlled because it's less than 0.3%, but the cannabis is. Because right. It's greater so, than 0.3. yeah, your hemp, your hemp is there's a number of indu- you know ind- industrial uses for hemp, a very valuable crop. Um, so th- this 2018 farm bill allowing for the production of hemp is is really a boon, and a lot of uh, folks already are taking advantage of it. Um, hemp naturally doesn't contain high amounts of THC. There's going to be trace amounts. Um, I don't know the agricultural aspect whether you need to. Um, that they, if it does go above 0.3%, it's like 0.3% dry weight if there's ways of extracting that out of it. But generally speaking, hemp is not going to cross that threshold, which is where they, that's why they made it the cutoff. So you get all the values of it, but you're not growing the, the marijuana or the pot, uh, if you will, the marijuana being the other one that does contain um, high amounts of THC. So I know initially when marijuana entered the market, it was for medicinal purposes, and we've seen a lot of states moving towards legalization um, for recreational use. What is the current framework in place? And part two, where does state regulation fit in with federal oversight? And should we anticipate seeing some new guidance come out from the FDA? All right. Well, yeah. There's there's a lot to unpack there, there and that's a number. Of, uh, there's multiple questions. So let, let me try to answer the, the the first one. So you're right. More states are legalizing it for recreational use, and they're opening up, or they're opening up their existing laws regarding the medicinal uh, marijuana use, uh, increasing the number of dispensaries or that sort of thing. 
But what that does, as folks are well aware of, it creates a patchwork of what's allowed and what isn't. And nobody likes dealing with the patchwork because it makes it difficult, if not impossible, for businesses involved in this industry to actually grow their business. Again, no pun intended there. Or it forces them to devote an inordinate amount of time and resources towards understanding the legal and regulatory ramifications of the entire supply chain, whether you're you're um, producing it, whether you're distributing it, whether you're uh, selling it, you know, through the commercialization. So they don't know what's allowed and what isn't. Add to that other laws that are peripherally related to the use of marijuana cannabis, and it's clear that the industry is far way ahead of where the regulators are in terms of development of a framework uh, that would provide some guidelines. And, and with the um, development of guidelines, it creates certainty for businesses. Um, so it's not so much the rules themselves, but give me the guardrails of what they are and then I'll figure out how to make my business successful once I have that regulatory framework in place. And that's what I think the industry is creating. So you hear a lot about this this green rush, the you know, the new the new crop and this is gonna be this is gonna explode like the tobacco industry did years ago. Well, I think that green rush has been a bit delayed. And I think the reason, uh, part of the reason for that, if not the primary reason, is that there's not that regulatory framework in place, at least, and, and it's not being developed, at least at, uh, not at the pace that observers or people that are involved in this industry would like. So that brings me to your second question, which is what is the federal oversight of this? Well, right now there really isn't the federal oversight that could clear up some of this patchwork we're seeing from the various states uh, that we're seeing today. So, you know, the FDA is moving slowly, as, as one would expect them to do, but they held an open meeting in May uh, of this past year and is currently accepting comments and input um, on it. But again, the FDA, like any other federal agency, they're not going to move quickly, and certainly not quickly enough for this industry. So there needs to be some sort of regulatory structure, again, put in place to provide that direction to everyone involved in this industry, whether you're a producer, manufacturer, distributor, or even a consumer of it, in order for, I think, this this green rush, as people are calling it, to really take flight. So does that answer your question? Yes, <laughs> it does, it does, thank you. Um, and I know there's been a lot of speculation in the market, so it's uh, an interesting topic, I think, on many levels. For companies that are currently producing cannabis or are involved in the production of CBD-based products, what should they be doing now? What controls should they begin to consider um, ahead of any current pending or future regulations on the state or federal level? So I, I think the real gaps here, and part of the reason that the FDA is moving so slowly on this, if I uh, could be candid, is that cannabis and the compounds derived from cannabis like CBD have not been studied or subject to the scientific rigor that the public expects or benefits from, for example, from the drug industry. And anybody listening to this who is involved in that can probably rattle off six, a dozen, two dozen various studies. And it's not to say that there aren't uh, numerous studies out there that seem to indicate that there are in fact benefits for various conditions uh, of CBD. Let's just focus on CBD as that seems to be the most widely uh, available prevalent studied compound, although there's thousands of, of compounds that can be derived from uh, the cannabis plant. So focusing on that, we have with 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 the exception of uh, Epidiolex, which is a CBD uh, based drug, approved drug that got approved last year, with CBD as the active pharmaceutical ingredient, uh, the FDA has really kind of made their position clear. They look at CBD, and therefore one can extrapolate from that all other compounds one would derive from cannabis as drugs. So you see thousands and literally thousands of CBD infused products out there. So the FDA is regulating those um, in such a way as, look, th these are drugs. And they're issuing a number of warning letters to companies out there. That's the enforcement arm for folks who aren't familiar with the FDA. A number of warning letters have been issued due to unsubstantiated claims with these CBD products. So you've got the FDA really focused on enforcement uh, in two avenues. One, the marketing of unapproved new or a misbranded human drug product. Uh, a no-no, and two, for those that are looking at classifying themselves as a dietary substance, uh, a dietary supplement, uh, unsubstantiated claims or lack of structure function claims, which are allowed with dietary supplements that are being made by companies marketing their products um, mm -hmm. under the dietary supplement or food uh, aspect of it. So 
um, again, they, they can have one anecdotal study, but it's not enough uh, for the agency or for the FDA to um, allow that specific claim. You, you can't be some peripheral or some anecdotal evidence. So you've got to have your well-controlled, your randomized, you know, developed clinical studies as similar to what one would have with a drug product in order to have the necessary support for any claims you're making. And, and add to that that you know the FDA is looking at these as drugs and up until last year any cannabis was a schedule one controlled substance so even if people wanted to study this difficult to do so when you have DEA regulation over it now with the uh, approval of this API uh, of this can uh, this epidiolex containing uh, CBD um, they've moved that to a schedule five still a controlled substance but at least um, schedule one where it's absolutely prohibited is, is no longer the case so there's got to kind of be that that freeing up uh, of, of the uh, to allow companies or individuals the ability to study this further and develop that scientific rigor or evidence in order to um, uh, substantiate or make some of these claims that are currently being made yeah, I think it's interesting because as you and I have talked about, this is a new and emerging regulation. Um, there are a number of different uses. So you have the food-based products, right? Candies, mm -hmm. brownies, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that treat pains and aches and whatnot. But then you see the pharmaceutical companies that are literally using this as um, incorporating it into their drug product to treat a specific, um, more serious condition. So, I don't know. I, I don't know if you have any comment there on that, but I thought it was interesting because it's two completely different ends of the spectrum. Well, the, the May, the, the, the May <coughs> meeting uh, was fascinating to me, and I, I attended virtually. I had it televised all day, so we're sitting here in my office. I had it on all day in my office. Um, my 12-year-old son happened to be at work with me that day, so he got to go home and tell his mom he learned all about weed. <laughs> um, but it was a fascinating open meeting. I, I, you know, I had it on in the background. At times, I was I was paying more attention than others. But of all the different constituents and interested parties that were involved there, you had high-profile uh, law firms commenting on it. Uh, you had uh, a number of large pharmaceutical companies commenting and really pushing for stringent regulations because they want to they want to create a barrier to entry they're looking at this from a business perspective and then you had mom and you know a lot of like I, what I would clear, classify as mom and pop shops commenting on you need to free up regulations in order for us to you know introduce this wonderful product to the rest of the world and I don't mean that to be facetious or anything because I I'm ambivalent I I, I think my, my current thinking on the benefits of it are I think there's just too much evidence, whether you want to call it anecdotal or there are some, you know, well controlled studies out there. I, I think there are benefits to this product. I don't don't get me wrong. But I don't think it's been done to the level that any approved drug by the FDA out there has been has has uh, been tested or studied. In fact, I think while we're moving slowly from a lot of observers perspective, a lot of this uh, legalization and, and freeing up of regulations um, is kind of being done by public fiat or public mm -hmm. just because public opinion is turning more positively toward it. And again, I'm one to look at it positively as well, especially if there are benefits. But there's got to be, I, I want to have confidence in what it is I'm taking. And I think that's the key area that uh, industry or organizations that set standards, if you will, uh, need to accelerate in order to create these guardrails for industry to um, comply with or or get out of the business yeah I agree it's a good point so I know again we, you know we've said a couple of times this is emerging but do you see or have you seen any trends that have come out um, as the FDA really put some scrutiny on the industry so yeah I mentioned it a little bit earlier there's a series of uh, warning letters that have that have uh, the FDA uh, again thousands of CBD based products you can look at probably a dozen warning letters that the FDA has issued just this past year so we're talking 2019 if you do a quick search uh, of warning letters and it, it's been basically around you've got a misbranded uh, or unapproved new drug 
uh, and you're making unsubstantiated claims. And I think any of us could go to, heck, we could go to our supermarket today and probably pick off half a dozen items mm -hmm. that are making s unsubstantiated claims about the uh, benefits of their CBD-infused products today. So the FDA's put an enforcement in place that way. Uh, the second piece, and again, part of it is with these warning letters that you see, but the positions being put up by the FDA is, look, they're looking at this as a drug. They've already approved a drug, and a company went through all of the rigmarole of getting a new drug approval for a, a product that whose active pharmaceutical ingredient, the, the API, is in fact CBD. So that is the view of the agency. So there's going to be regulation coming. There's going to be, at some point in time, as I've said to some clients we have, have already, there's going to be CGMP requirements in place. Um, when that happens is, I think, difficult for anybody to predict. But what makes this so exciting to me is I feel like it's we've got a, a, a blank, uh, a, a clean palette here. That industry, you know, with these open meetings, I think with some legislative efforts, some lobbying, what have you, or just you know putting well thought out position papers in uh, in place, can have a hand in the development of what I do think will be a green rush uh, eventually of, of developing this industry, and that's what kind of makes it really exciting to me at this point in time. So what should folks be concerned with if they're currently working in the industry or trying to enter the industry? And how does a company like RCA help them, uh, support them through this? Is there a review of quality management systems? How does that all play into this? So I think, and, it, and that's a good question, really the key question, why are, why are we RCA having this discussion? I think there's a lot already. So I say it's a it's a it's a blank palette, right? I think there's a lot of guidance out there already that one can take from regulation of the drug industry um, in terms of what companies should be working on or should should be focused on. So um, part of my background, as you know, um, I used to work uh, for Walgreens uh, in, in their corporate legal department. There's a lot of um, DEA regulations uh, in place, and the DEA still has some involvement here. So you should be looking at security concerns, um, distribution concerns, you know, tra tracking your product. From an FDA and drug perspective, you should be looking at, uh, we talk CGMPs, you should be looking at your good manufacturing processes. There are a number of FDA guidance out there about drugs that are developed from botanicals. So there's guidances on actual taking botanicals turn them into a drug product, well, why is that? That's as applicable to the cannabis industry as it is to anything, right? Especially, we've got one drug approved and we've got thousands of compounds. I look at any number of drugs that, that could potentially be approved with um, compounds derived from, from the cannabis plant. Those guidances have been out there for years, and I think industry should, should be uh, looking at these. The, but the fact is, up until you know recently, a lot of folks who are involved in the cannabis industry are not familiar with FDA regulations. We at RCA have a number of regulatory uh, experts. We have a number of quality experts that can um, help get facilities up and running and do the necessary verification and validation work to um, put out a quality product. And you haven't asked the question, but I'll, I'll add it in here, and I, you know, feel free to interrupt if you like, but. I think one of the key things that's going to spell success or lack of success or, or lack of success for a lot of companies, and I don't care if you're big or small in this industry, is, op I guess to, to put it simply, operating within a state of control. Um, back in my Walgreens days, we used to do testing of a number of uh, vitamin manufacturers, which litter the shelves, right? If you just look at the dietary supplements, and the level of strength or what they said was in those vitamins and what was actually in them, and this is going back even before 2000 when I, I'm a lot older than I, than I should to admit, <laughs> um, was a huge discrepancy. I think the same thing is, is occurring today. So all of these dietary supplements, all these CBD products out there, I don't think the public can or, or frankly should trust what that labeling is saying as to what they contain and the strength of what those products contain. I think to the extent you can have a quality control system in place that can produce consistent product, that as much as anything is going to dictate 
whether you're successful in this business or not. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off on a little side tangent and I'm gonna ask for your opinion. I know that right now the way that most states have their recreational products set up is you go to a dispensary and you know you buy your product from them. Do you ever foresee this product being in a place where it is sold in places like Walgreens or CVS, Target, over-the-counter type of things outside of a dispensary? So are you talking, so I've been, <coughs> we've been using the terms interchangeably mm -hmm. as well, which I'm using cannabis kind of as a general term, mm -hmm. but are you asking specifically like marijuana? In this no, case, the stuff with the psychoactive effects, the THC? Not necessarily, well, I guess maybe because that's the controlled element, right? Yeah. So if you go to like Massachusetts, you can go into the dispensary and you can get a, a range of different products. You can buy the edibles, I think. Um, I don't know if you can buy um, the inhalant or not, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, to your point, what you said before, it does seem a little bit like a supplement, and maybe that depends on what it is. If it's a hemp product, which you can buy in a store, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I so let me. This is purely mm -hmm. opinion and speculation, and and certainly, anybody listening who who wants uh, further discussion happy to do it but this is purely speculation on my part I look at it as and maybe I've taken a very libertarian point of view but from a THC based product we sell alcohol today right mm -hmm. and that can have there, there's regulations around the sale and consumption of alcohol you can't drink and drive until we have a regulatory framework in place I think that the same should be applied to uh, the psychoactive pieces of, of mm -hmm. cannabis or you know let's call it marijuana for, for general purposes so there's got to be that control. So what does driving under the influence of marijuana mean? Well, there's different definitions and interpretations of that across the states right now. So I think until you have those in place, you're not going to see it. To answer your question, I think someday you will see it. Um, one can look to the Netherlands for, for this. Um, you can go into a store. You can go into a dispensary, if you will. Anybody off the street who's of legal legal drinking mm -hmm. age, so let's call it likely 21 years of age. Anybody with a valid ID should be able to go in and purchase that. Now what you do after you imbibe that and ingest that in whatever way you, you know, you're talking, whether it's eaten, whether it's smoked, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know other, other ways, but um, you know, there has to be a legal framework in place of how you deal with that or, or, or address that or, or ensure in this case, public safety in that. You can't drink and drive, you shouldn't, probably shouldn't be able to smoke and drive. Yeah. So, yeah, long term, <clears throat> yes. Now, if you wanna ask me for when, we're sitting here in 2019, I, I, that's one I'm not gonna speculate on. I think it'll be sooner than later. I think it'll be in our lifetime, um, certainly, maybe within the next five or 10 years, but there's a lot of other steps that need to be taken before you see something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's interesting because things have changed so much even in the past four years. Sure, even so. in the past, really, the farm bill, 2018 farm bill was passed in December 2018. Now I think everybody, I, I don't think it was any surprise, but even so, you know, we're in less than a year. Look at just the avalanche mm -hmm. of CBD-based products we've seen out there. You can't turn around without running into a CBD-based product. So, I mean, that's ten months. So, yeah. so think what the other 10 months will bring. And again, that's why um, anybody who holds themselves out as an expert in this industry, I, the, I, I'm not saying that they're not, but the, the, the ground is constantly shifting that I think uh, unless you're paying attention to this sort of thing every day like we are here, you're going to miss developments or you're going to miss maybe opportunities to... Um, get an advantage over your competitor if you're in this business or something because it really is changing on, on a daily basis. Yeah. In fact, what you and I laughed about this before we started the podcast. We were supposed to do this a month ago, and mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I want to kind of see what's going on here. Well, I want to see what these developments are here. Well, I want to get a little more information here. But the fact is, on an almost daily basis, there's information. So the discussion you and I are having here today could be a very different discussion 30 days from now, mm -hmm. let alone a year from now. That is true, and perhaps a, a follow-up podcast would be appropriate in a couple of months as things change.
I, I can't wait for you know, the five star <laughs> reviews we get for the podcast. So if there's a lot of one star reviews, maybe not. So do you have any final thoughts in closing? Yeah, I so I, I do. So my my thoughts on this are based on the questions I've received from others uh, uh, companies out there and, and producers out there. Um, there's a lot I think folks need to do to educate themselves, and I think we can probably break that down into a digest uh, format for you and tell you what's important, what isn't. Um, I know I've had a number of questions from people who are looking at expanding their operations. So from a manufacturing perspective and what do they need to, to be thinking about, certainly GMP I think at this point in time is a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. In a year, two years, three years, it's going to become a requirement. What does GMP look like? We have experts on the drug side that can apply a lot of GMP on the food side, on the dietary supplement side, that we can apply a lot of the um, requirements that we see and what is important and what isn't to this particular industry. Um, getting to uh, interpreting legislation, fr frankly getting to legislators to get them to understand a company's position on it um, are things that RCA uh, has done in the past and in, uh, in other industries and can help with here. Um, so, you know, I look at GMPs, but I, I, at the end of the day, if I'm saying the most important thing, it is quality control, knowing what's in your product. And that comes from years of being involved on the dietary supplement side and vitamins and knowing that what the public's ingesting isn't maybe what they think it is or certainly isn't what, what is uh, on the label. So you look at your promotion, what, what you're promoting it for, and, and basically being able to produce on a repeatable basis what you say you are actually producing. I think those are the key items um, uh, that folks need to focus on right now until they're, <coughs> once, so once there are standards in place, they can say, yep, we meet those standards and here's how we meet those standards and here's the documentation and proof showing that we meet those standards consistently. Those are gonna be the successful companies. The companies who don't do it or say that they do it and then turns out that they don't, they're not gonna be around. Yeah. Well, Neil, thank you for taking the time to provide us with your insights today. To learn more about RCA services, visit www.rcainc.com. And thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of RCA Radio. Be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when we upload a new episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me.